Good morning, everyone. How are we doing this morning? I would like it to sound more exciting. We have a prime minister coming. How are we doing this morning? That's more like it. Thank you, Alex, for the introduction and truly for developing these inspiring new solve challenges and for orchestrating this week's terrific events for Solve at MIT. So indeed, I have the great privilege of introducing two remarkable people this morning. As you know, one of them is the Right Honorable Justin Trudeau, 23rd Prime Minister of Canada. Are there any Canadians in the audience, I, I guess? But let me begin with the speaker from MIT. To welcome the Prime Minister this morning and to moderate the Q&A with all of you, we have chosen someone very special, Professor Daniel Wood of MIT's Media Lab. <laughs> Professor Wood leads the Space Enabled Research Group, where she designs innovative systems that harness space technology, including satellites, to address development challenges around the world. Incidentally, Professor Wood belongs to a very small group of very special people, those who have earned four degrees from MIT. <laughs> Daniel, in a moment, I'll ask you to come on, on stage with the Prime Minister, but before, I'll offer a few words to welcome our guest of honor. Since taking office in 2015, Prime Minister Trudeau has built a reputation as a practical optimist. He has worked for, to foster prosperity that benefits everyone by investing in science and promoting an innovation-based economy. In fact, he described these plans in an op-ed in yesterday's Boston Globe. A champion of Canada's diversity the Prime Minister has worked to find a path to reconciliation with the nation's indigenous peoples, and he has been famously welcoming to refugees. At home and on the global stage, he's a passionate advocate for fighting climate change, and is leading a thoughtful transition away from fossil fuels. And as the person who appointed Canada's first gender balanced cabinet. He has, what a role model. He has set a remarkable standard as a feminist and a leader. For all these reasons and more, we're absolutely delighted to have him with us today. Now, I believe that this is the Prime Minister's first visit to Cambridge. So I thought, he would be feel more at home if he knew that Canada and MIT have a great deal in common. For instance, Canada and MIT are both known for having a long, friendly rivalry with a slightly more famous neighbor. <laughs> Canada and MIT both chose leaders who are bilingual, though Minister Trudeau speaks both of his language perfectly. <laughs> I speak both of mine with an accent. <laughs> Canada and MIT are actually represented by the same symbolic animal, the beaver. I'm wearing it today on my tie for the occasion. Well, MIT chose the beaver because it is nature's engineer Canada chose the beaver because it was nature's best source of fur to make fancy Victorian hats. <laughs> but, but there is a kinship. <laughs> Canada and MIT are both home to a lot of brilliant Canadians. In our case, 261 students, 154 staff, 29 faculty members, and I'm certain all of them are here today. 
And of course, Canada and MIT are both famous for their winter sports. You have hockey, we have math. <laughs> but, but above all, both Canada and MIT are exceptionally diverse and welcoming communities focused on the future. And those characteristics also apply to solve. Solve cultivates inventive answers to humanity's great challenges by connecting people with insight, ideas, and influence from around the world. Needless to say, we are thrilled that Prime Minister Trudeau has chosen to join the SOLVE community today. Mr. Prime Minister and Professor Wood, will you please come to the stage and the rest of us, please join me in offering a very warm MIT welcome to the Right Honorable Justin Trudeau, Prime Minister of Canada. Good morning. Good morning, Danielle. And good morning to all of you. And welcome. We are so excited to be with you today. And I believe you want to give us a few opening comments. Uh, just uh, first of all, what a, what a pleasure it is uh, to be here at MIT, where so many of uh, the challenges of the future are not just being uh, you know, thought about, but are being solved. And that's uh, very much something that I think is a mindset uh, that we need to spread around the world. Uh, there, there's obviously, we're living in a time of tremendous uh, disruption, tremendous change, and when you think about it, the change paradox is that the pace of change has never been so fast, and yet it'll never be this slow again. We are accelerating in the challenges that are coming at us, and we as a, as a species, as civilizations, as individuals, have to try and you know, figure out how to deal with it. And the choice that we face collectively is either we are afraid of that change and we cling to the way things used to be and get nostalgic and anchored in the status quo and try and hold off as long as we can, or else we decide to shape the change. We decide to say, okay, the world is changing. Let's figure out what it looks like. Let's shape it. Let's, let's lead that future. And that's very much what's happening here at MIT and in extraordinary institutions like it uh, around the country, around the world. But that's also very much the mindset we're taking in Canada. Uh, we realize that the pace of change means workplaces are going to get disrupted, uh, supply chains, relationships, uh, jobs, career paths, uh, lifestyles. There's going to be tremendous shifts uh, in the coming years. And the choice we've made collectively as a country is to say, okay, let's be part of it. Let's not shy away from it. And it's, it's a deliberate choice, but it's also not an easy choice because when people are anxious, when people are worried about their future and even more about their kids' future and about whether or not that idea of progress that has the next generation automatically doing better than the previous generation, well, there's a sense that that might not hold now the way it used to. So that anxiety can lead to polarization, it can lead to, uh, to, to, to you know, closing in or being fear, fearful of the world. And what we're choosing in Canada uh, is to instead say, okay, uh, let's focus on how we allay that anxiety, how we give confidence to people in the future, and that means moving forward boldly. We've been uh, investing massively in AI, uh, as we did quietly over the past decades through the AI, latest AI winter, where uh, you know, researchers, particularly uh, uh, Jeffrey Hinton in Toronto, Joshua Bengio in Montreal, and uh, Rich Coleman in Edmonton, uh, have been pushing through and have created and provided the underpinnings of what modern AI is right now. And that happened in Canada. So we're pouring uh, our energies and efforts into that because we know that not only creating stronger AI is going to be important for Canada's success and for the world's success, but shaping what 
parameters exist around that AI, what rules are in place and what principles guide our thinking and our actions on that area, in that area uh, in the coming decades. Uh, is something that I think Canada has a sense of responsibility and a sense of capacity to try and reflect on and talk about with all sorts of other people. So the way we're looking into the future is uh, with confidence, with understanding that diversity uh, is and should always be a source of strength, not a source of weakness. Again, it's a little more difficult at first to work alongside or engage with someone who doesn't have the same backstory or perspective that you do. But all of you who know when you're working in small groups, when you're you know, trying to get creative and solve new problems, having someone with, with a different perspective, with a different story, working alongside you to try and solve it, allows you to see around those corners even quicker and come up with better solutions. So our focus on bringing together diversity of points of view, diversity from around the world, and also ensuring that through our education system, through our support of entrepreneurs, through our uh, you know, organizations and, and businesses, we always make sure that there is room for everyone. When that means, of course, being a proud feminist, uh, including women in uh, our paths to success. Because when you have the full range of uh, you know, people involved, we're gonna get better solutions. But it also means including marginalized communities and vulnerable communities and making sure there are pathways for everyone to input and participate in solving these challenges that we're facing. So that's a little bit about the mindset and mentality that Canada has as we face these times of change. And I know from having had conversations with Danielle, with the president, with uh, a range of, of folks here at MIT, that that's very much the mindset that you're bringing to this, uh, uh, this world that we are busy creating together. And that's why I'm really, really excited for this uh, opportunity to be with you here today, to talk a bit about Canada, but mostly to hear from you uh, about what you're questioning about, where your questions are, where your thinking is, uh, and to uh, have a great conversation with Danielle. So thank you so much for inviting me here to uh, the SOLVE conference. It's really exciting to be here. Thank you so much for those opening remarks. And let me please just take a moment and share with the audience what we'll do over the next hour or so. We have time first for a dialogue. I have some exciting and challenging questions for you over the next few minutes. And I, of course, invite the audience to think about questions you would like to ask. Later, I'll invite you uh, to take questions that you can raise your hand. And we have several women in the audience who will bring a mic to you. So we'll take time to give each other a chance to share. So be thinking about your questions over the next few minutes. I'd love to start. And I'll say that uh, you're the second head of state I've had a chance to meet since I've had this job. So for those who are students thinking about your future, faculty has some perks. <laughs> and I'll just add that, well, unlike the Prime Minister of India, who only got the selfie and the handshake with me, you get the privilege of a half hour discussion. So yeah, I think you're really running out. I'm a very lucky man. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Any day I'm luckier than India is a good day. <laughs> I want to start right off with some personal reflection. I wonder if there's a story you're willing to share with us from your childhood. In particular, I'd like to ask, was there a time when you were a child that you started to understand that people who were different from you had equal value to you? That even though they may come from a different background, have a different kind of home or family, that they were worth fighting for uh, as a leader? Um. Well, I mean, first of all, as a kid, I wasn't thinking of you know, fighting for as a leader. I was just thinking of uh, making friends and understanding the world. And you know, one of the things that was uh, particular about me growing up was uh, my father was Prime Minister of Canada for the first 13 years of my life. Uh, so I was sort of born into it. And even though we went to, I went to the local elementary public school, um, we had you know, I took the school bus to school, but there was, you know, an RCMP police motorcade following the school bus. Um, you know, and, and I remember at one point, uh, you know, one of my, one of my best friends um, was, uh, was, a, was a kid named Mark, uh, and I didn't know 
much about his backstory. I mean, I lived in a house, the, the, the official residence of the Prime Minister um, when I was growing up uh, has 13 bathrooms in it, so it's not exactly a starter home. Um, and, and for me, I was always aware that I was luckier than my friends and that it wasn't uh, due to me. It was, I just got lucky being born into the family that I was. It wasn't any worth that I had. My father and mother were very careful to try and keep me grounded, but I, I'll never forget a moment where I was, um, it, it was, I guess I was about seven years old and uh, Hang on, are there any, I heard a baby in the audience. Are there any children seven or under in this room? Okay, it was the year I figured out there wasn't a Santa Claus, okay? <laughs> that was actually, spoiler alert. Um, <laughs> And you know, I, I was really excited. It was it was a discussion between my mom and dad about the batteries for a Santa Claus present, and they'd got the wrong ones. And I said, "Oh well, obviously there." Um, but I got back to school in that January, and I said, figured it out, you know, laid it out. And my buddy Mark said, "Oh, I uh, I'd known that." And I said, yeah, yeah, sure you knew that. Well, if you'd known, you would have told me. No, I didn't want to ruin it for anyone else. I said, well, how did you know? And I knew he lived with his mom, but I didn't know much about that. He goes, well, my mom explained to me that she couldn't afford to get two presents for me. She told me there was no Santa Claus. And it hit me like a ton of bricks that, I mean, I, I was a prime minister, so I got presents from like ambassadors I'd never met. Uh, and you know, piles of presents and this idea that my friend who I played with every day, who I knew, was just had such a different experience from me uh, was really a wake-up call not to feel guilty about the luck I'd have, but to say, okay, you know, for some reason the universe has given you opportunities that must come with a responsibility. And that, that, that sense of you know, trying to do right by the opportunities that I've been given, that we've all been given, but you've all certainly been given by being here at MIT. Um, that's, that's one of the driving things that made me understand that there is a responsibility for those of us who have succeeded or those of us who have opportunities to think about using those opportunities in service of the world around us to try and make it a better place and, and help those who haven't had those opportunities. And those, that diversity of stories that I then collected throughout my life in traveling and uh, getting to know people from all sorts of different backgrounds, uh, you know, meeting Canadians in every corner of the country uh, and people around the world has continued to impress on me the fact that there is so much value in learning and understanding anyone you speak with and, and meet uh, because everyone has uh, a new and different perspective to bring to bear on your own story and on the story we're building together. Thank you, appreciate that. Let's think about leadership. I'll share that my own personal understanding of what makes a good leader includes casting a vision by speaking the truth of what's happening currently as well as the truth of what you'd like to see in the future. It also includes a lot of listening. I know you spent a lot of time listening to people across the country and the world. And it includes making really challenging decisions, but in a way that's very inclusive and allows people on your team to give opportunities and to give input. Can you reflect on your own definition of leadership? I think there's, there's a tendency to think of leadership and relate it to sort of the authority and being the strongest person around or being the person who you know tells everyone else what to do I don't see and certainly there's context in which that kind of leadership um, has its place um, or certainly had its place in the past but I think that leadership has become much more about gathering people around a common cause uh, or a common idea or a common theme and empowering them to achieve their potentials and do their very best 
to contribute to it. And the difference in leadership today from what it used to be is leadership used to be, and I said a few words about this a couple of days ago as I've been thinking about it, leadership used to be very tribal. Um, if you were the leader, it was because you were considered the best or the strongest or the rightest representative of your tribe, whatever that tribe is, uh, socioeconomic grouping, ethnic grouping, religious grouping, or you know, grouping of, of a democracy, of, a, of, of you know, like-minded people, whatever it was, you were the best representative and that made you the leader and the boss. But we now have such diversity and such differences that leadership has to be much more about pulling together people who are different from each other and therefore different from you around a common purpose, around a common set of ideals. And I encountered that sort of early on in politics where you know, people gather around politicians as sort of volunteers and they want to sort of help out and go knock doors and, and, and you know, sign up new members and in the, in the beginning of politics that was very much what it was all about for me. Uh, and you could really tell the people who were coming around because we shared a vision and the people who were coming around because they thought maybe there was a meal ticket because I might be prime minister one day. And, and that what I really learned to develop was a capacity or, or, or a, 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 a desire anyway to pull together people of all sorts of different backgrounds who were in it not out of personal drive or what it's going to get later, but a sense of are we building something together that's meaningful, that we can agree on, that matters. And that kind of leadership that says, okay, we've got a big challenge, let's solve it, and how are we going to do that, is very much what I've been able to to, to, to see around our cabinet table over the past two and a half years. As uh, was mentioned by the president, we, uh, I put together uh, Canada's first gender balanced cabinet, half women, half men. Uh, we pause and, and celebrate that, that's yeah. really good. Thank you. <laughs> But there's also, you know, much greater diversity in that in terms of ethnic background, but also in terms of stories. I mean, we have, you know, people who've, you know, run, you know, multi-million dollar companies, but we've also had uh, folks who've, who've run, uh, you know, shelters for homeless people. Uh, we've had, you know, you know, international doctors, we've had, you know, soldiers, we, like, I mean, there's a huge range of perspectives around that cabinet table that when we sit down and work on a common problem, which is you know, how to grow a better Canada and create opportunities for more people, the perspectives that come together are amazingly varied and we're all in service of the same thing. And that as a model for generating not just better solutions, but more durable and all-encompassing solutions that really reflect the diversity of the population that we are there to serve makes, makes it a lot better both for the short term and the long term. So my leadership challenge is very much that. It's how to enable each of those you know, diverse voices to be working, succeeding, contributing, shaping the country the best possible way. And it, of course, goes out from there. Mm -hmm. And reflecting on how you opened our discussion, I would argue that your leadership challenge is also at the global level. And I want to ask, can we reflect on the global moment that we find ourselves in? Part of how I think about that in my research, I lead a team called Space Enabled, and our goal is to use technology from space to support the sustainable development goals. We find it to be a very useful list of the key challenges of our time. We must end poverty and ensure that everyone has access to clean water, to food, to education. And we know there's ongoing challenges in areas like uh, global slavery, which still happens, and child sex trafficking. There are still so many vulnerable communities that we must still continue to concern ourselves with, even those outside our national borders. Can you please reflect with me on how you think of yourself as a global leader? Well, I, I have had the extreme good fortune of uh, working with and getting to know and being friends with uh, a number of extraordinary astronauts. Uh, and one of the things that happens when people go to, I mean, our, our Minister of Transport uh, has, is, it was Canada's first astronaut, uh, Mark Garneau, our uh, current Governor General, who is uh, the Queen's representative in Canada, um, is, is, uh, is uh, 
uh, Julie Payette, uh, an, an extraordinary astronaut. So one of the things that any astronaut you talk to talks about when they talk about the Earth seen from space is there are no borders. Um, the, the, the challenges we face and the, and the con interconnectedness uh, within the you know, closed system which, within which we are, with the exception of energy inputs from the sun and the odd meteorite, uh, means that we are all uh, interconnected and interdependent in a way that we haven't been trained to think about as, as a species. I mean, the idea when you, when you think of you know, uh, the, the Homo sapiens and the fact that we've been around for about a couple hundred thousand years, uh, and for most of that time we were hunter-gatherers living in small, small groupings, the idea that actions that we could take would somehow affect the climate or a, 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 a hunting or resources we could gather would somehow lead the earth to run out of those resources is completely beyond our instincts, our, our, our understanding, our primal understanding of the world. And we now have to use our science, our knowledge, our brain, as opposed to our spinal column and our instincts, to, to change our our instincts, our, our, our approaches to solving problems. We now have to understand that, you know, even though it looks like the world goes on forever, it doesn't. And the choices we make have an impact on ourselves, on our climate, on our planet, and on our neighbors, even if they live on the other side of the world. And that challenge of bringing us together around science and facts and data when we know that human beings don't do a very good job. I mean, the, the, the behavioral psychology and, the, and the, you know, all the, all the you know, great books on, on how you know, people actually make decisions and how we evaluate risks have demonstrated that we're terrible at making choices in terms of what's in our best interest. So how we create organizations and therefore governments that actually do a better job of not just recognizing and understanding the scope and scale of the challenges we're facing, but convince their citizens that we do have to do something about this far off problem that doesn't seem tangible to you is, I think, the big challenge of leadership in the 21st century. It has been at the past end of the 20th century, but it, it, you know, it's getting more acute now because we weren't very good at solving it at the end of the 20th century. And that, that challenge as we move forward on how we involve everyone in the solutions we're going to create uh, is very much what I think democracies need to turn themselves to now. That's an excellent transition as we reflect on these days of, with the solvers here. Can we have a round of applause for our solvers? Thank you so much for your work here. As you know, we've been celebrating the excellent ideas from people around the world who responded to the call for challenges put forth by the Solve team. So some people here have already spent time applying their idea in our Solve community and some are preparing to respond to our next cycle of challenges. And we are excited about the concept that, of course, we expect good ideas to come from anywhere. And I wanted to ask, how, what is your definition of problem solving from the point of view of the role that government plays uh, to address the problems in your own country and around the world? What role do you see particularly for government? Um, well, I've always been fascinated by problem solving, uh, so much so that even though uh, I studied um, you know, literature in university and uh, was very much a uh, arts side of things. Um, I've always been fascinated by, you know, physics and math and I'm a regular, you know, uh, subscriber to XKCD and I'm, a, you know, I, I, I do a lot of science fiction. Sure. I even did uh, two years of engineering, uh, which, uh, which I absolutely loved, but uh, was, uh, was not for me ultimately. Um, <laughs> matrix, matrix math was just a little further than I wanted no, to uh, to dig into. No, it just they didn't teach it in the way that you needed to learn. <laughs> No, no, no. I, I, you know, I actually, I, I, I loved it. And what I loved the most about it was, was that aspect 
of, of problem solving. I mean, coming at it as an, problems as an engineer. My grandfather was an engineer, and and, and his approach and and the the you know, figuring things out for me has always been one of my one of my great passions. So. I think as we look at the challenges we're facing, I'm really a fan of the, the grand challenges approach that MIT is so good at, and so much so we've, we've brought in uh, a smart cities challenge that was very much uh, based on something that was done here in the United States, uh, where we're trying to challenge uh, our cities to step up and innovate and become smarter through a big contest. Uh, similarly, uh, we've got smart challenges around, uh, grand challenges around uh, women entrepreneurship, and we're trying to bring people in different ways, and it's not quite the gamification of, uh, of public engagement, but a little bit, trying to trick people into solving uh, big problems by putting it together in a way that does connect individuals with uh, their community without having to feel like, well, you have to go through government to, uh, uh, to get there and have an impact. And that idea of empowering individuals and smart, creative people to actually weigh in on shaping their community and their world uh, is, I think, going to be an extraordinarily powerful driver, not just of uh, creating solutions for the challenges we're facing, for the problems we're, we're, we're seeing, but for actually creating better, more resilient societies for everyone. When people are active, engaged citizens thinking about the impact of uh, you know, their choices, their, uh, their, their challenges, their solutions on their neighborhood, their community, their city, their state, their country, their world, uh, suddenly we start to see a different kind of world where people do take uh, a sense of ownership and engagement over the big picture and not just uh, their tiny, discrete, gated corner of it. And I think that's, that's really where you know, folding everyone in in new and interesting ways to our common problems uh, is going to be an essential path forward. And that's why I'm so glad to be here at uh, Solve MIT. So let's dig into a few issues a little more deeply. Let's talk about natural resources. Mm -hmm. Canada, of course, is a country that is elegantly endowed with many benefits and resources there, but can we imagine a future in which the economy is really not driven by natural resources? And how do you man plan to support the transition to that state? I remember a conversation I had when I was a kid uh, where I looked around my, uh, my room mm -hmm. and uh, my radio uh, was, my stereo system was uh, made in Japan. Uh, my coolest toys were made in Japan. Uh, all, the, all the neat things that I had in the you know, early 80s were made in Japan. And I kept saying, well, why any of, isn't any of this stuff made in Canada? And my dad was prime minister at the time, so I said, Dad, why don't we make any of these cool things here in Canada? Uh, and, and the answer I got back, not, not from him, but as I kept asking this question to different people, uh, was, well, you see, Japan uh, is uh, a, you know, sort of a rock in the middle of the ocean with not a lot of natural resources, so they've had to massively invest in their people, in education, in innovation, in you know, being, uh, you know, being technological and smart. And Canada, well, we have lots of natural resources, so we haven't had to do that. <laughs> And I remember being really pissed off. I appreciate uh, that. And you're like, wait, wait, wait. So we have all these advantages, but because we have all these advantages, we can't be smart and innovative too. And of course, uh, you know, what we actually see, what I'm very proud of now, is how we do uh, natural resource development um, is increasingly you know, high technology, research, science-based, and uh, will continue to be. But it shouldn't be seen as the be all and end all, although there are some advantages to it. I mean, the fact that Canada has always had too small a market and too small a population to be able to draw from all the benefits of our natural resources have made us naturally, positively inclined towards trade. Okay, uh, and there hasn't been well that, that debate over trade in Canada. I mean, there's always a little bit of debate, but there hasn't been that. So we've been able to go out and sign trade deals around the world. We're now the only G7 country uh, with trade deals with every other 
G7 country. We have access to two-thirds of the world's markets and are going to continue to because we've been able to both make the case for it that it's good for growth, but also uh, do some of the things that have allayed people's fears around trade and it, it demonstrated that, yes, we can continue to protect the environment and protect labor standards uh, and include small businesses and women and marginalized communities in the benefits of the growth that comes from global trade. And that's what we're, we've been fairly insistent in how we negotiate our trade deals around the world, that making a case for trade benefiting everyone has to be an integral part of trade deals that we sign. So that, that perspective that comes in large cases from having lots of fish and yes furs, as the president uh, mentioned, um, has led us to a place where we know that trade matters, but now the investments we're making in um, education, in skills training, uh, the fact that we have more uh, STEM graduates in our largest province of Ontario, a population of about 13 million people, uh, than they do in California, uh, which has uh, about the population of all of Canada. Uh, so, you know, every year we have more STEM graduates out of Ontario. So, we have been doubling down on education, doubling down on skills training in a way that says, look, there's a lot of folks who are perhaps in a job that they're looking at sort of the long term horizon and realizing, okay, I'm 40 now. I don't think this job is going to be able to carry me through till retirement. Uh, the, the pace of change is too fast. Uh, I need to find a different career, and I don't know how to do that. Well, we've actually put in deliberately uh, significant supports for uh, people going back to school, even if they have a family, even if they have another job, all those things to try and make sure that people are getting the tools they need, largely STEM programming, uh, technological training and, and, and skills development, so that they can get those new jobs. So that reassurance and that investment in our people is really at the center of what we're doing. Um, but we'll continue to draw on our natural resources as well. Let's go deeper on the point of trade to say it's not just a question of how you create opportunities within your own country, but it affects also the global supply chain. I've been reflecting lately on the way that large companies and countries as they create trade deals are partly influencing the lives of farmers and people in many parts of the value chain around the world. And we want to consider uh, how there can be both um, fair labor practices as well as environmental sustainability through actually trade negotiations. And how do you approach that? Uh, you, obviously, you, you want to be careful uh, around the world to not uh, be uh, overly um, prescriptive or normative around your expectations of the world. As we, as we engage with different countries around the world, uh, if we try and say, oh, well, you can't, you can't you know, do this, you can't do that. They'll say, well, listen, you did that for a decade, for decades, for a century, and now you're saying we can't do that even though you did it for, you know, a hundred years and now you're at a different point. You know, there's, there's need to be a sensitivity and a respect, but there is also a question that, an, an undeniable fact, that trade has uh, increased uh, opportunities for everyone. The number of people living in extreme poverty uh, has declined massively. The opportunities for education and benefits around the world. And we, we tend to fall into this trap of, oh, the world's terrible and it's getting worse. And we see all these conflicts. We see all this violence. Uh, I highly recommend uh, a book by one of my, my favorite authors, who's actually a, a local guy for you guys, even though he's a Montrealer originally, uh, Steven Pinker, who wrote uh, Enlightenment Now recently. Uh, and he he's, he's makes a very, very uh, cogent argument uh, for how we need to uh, understand that yes, the world is getting better, and we should, but we should not be complacent about it. But we shouldn't be sort of uh, so down on ourselves uh, and so prone to you know thinking the worst of ourselves and our mechanisms and uh, and the challenges we're facing. But be clear-eyed about how we can use things like trade uh, and international development dollars and science and knowledge to actually improve outcomes uh, for everyone around the world and that that sense of responsibility particularly for Canada comes in as we look at we're hosting the G7 meeting in in a number of, uh, of weeks where uh, we're the president of the uh, the G7 uh, economic forum uh, this year 
and uh, one of the big focuses is going to be on uh, educating women and girls in crisis areas because we do a good job of education in general, we do a good job of humanitarian support uh, in crisis areas, but that education in crisis areas like refugee camps or failed states is one of the hardest things to do and we need to be investing in that. So there's a lot of things we can do. Trade is a piece of it because of course you know, teaching someone how to fish versus giving them a fish uh, is, uh, is a much better approach. Or asking them how they already fish because a lot of them already know actually. There we go. Traditional <laughs> knowledge and, uh, and uh, indigenous understanding is a huge part of it as well. And I know that you have a great uh, f focus on that as well in your work. We have come to the time where we want to invite members from the audience to ask questions as well. So thank you, I already see the hands raising. I'll ask your patience. We're gonna to work together and okay. invite uh, people. You, sir, in the uh, white, the uh, white sweatshirt there. Please yeah, just wait stand for the up. microphone. Yep, you stand up and we'll get a mic to you. Thank you. The mic will allow us to let the online audience hear the questions as well. Of course. Thank you so much. Hi. Uh, I'm Brandon. I work at MIT uh, in a federally funded research and defense center. My question is about populism. So you had mentioned that Canada's approach is very forward-looking in terms of all the technological changes, but around the world I think we've seen an increase in the amount of uh, resentment and that has led in many instances to cases of populist governments. Is Canada also vulnerable to this kind of backsliding? If not, what makes Canada different? And if so, uh, what are you doing to prevent that? Yeah. Thanks. Great question. Um, Canada is uh, not immune to that. Uh, a great example is uh, around immigration. Um, we uh, have you know, many of the same kinds of debates and concerns uh, that exist elsewhere around the world around immigration. Uh, and you know, there are fears and concerns highlighted. We are just uh, at this point managing, and I, and I consider one of my most important responsibilities as, uh, as, as a leader is to protect this extraordinary um, advantage, extraordinary element or gift that we have in Canada of being positively inclined towards immigration and refugees. And it comes uh, from a very uh, strong place of the fact that we know that waves of people coming to Canada uh, as they came to North America and elsewhere around the world uh, have contributed tremendously to our success and that sense that we need to continue that, we need to continue to allow people who are arriving in our country to have pathways uh, to success, to acquire language skills, to uh, become uh, successful, to create opportunities for their kids, to integrate them into being Canadians. We don't call uh, immigrants immigrants in Canada, we call them new Canadians. Uh, and that approach to uh, recognizing that uh, that our identity doesn't come through a historical or cultural or you know, geographic or ethnic uh, reality. Uh, it comes from a shared set of values that we aspire to and, and, uh, and define ourselves through. That leaves an openness that is, that is very positive. But at the same time, the anxieties that we see around the world about, oh, are, are we going to have a good future? Are our kids going to have a good future? Uh, you know, is, 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 is success and is change passing us by? Are we going to end up worse off? Are things that we have to address. And the way we've been able to do that so far in Canada has been by saying and insisting that, look, we can solve our problems better if we pull together than if we try and point fingers and lay blame. And that was the nature of the election campaign two and a half years ago, where uh, the, the campaign we had featured uh, you know, a party that was very much pushing Islamophobia around the edges, uh, intolerance, some challenges uh, around you know, the, that trend of populism that, that we've sometimes seen. Uh, and we chose to make a very strong, positive, non-personal attack based, um, inclusive, we can do this. We have faced down bigger problems than these problems we were facing before and succeeded. And we're going to succeed this one, but only if we pull together and only if we stay true to who we are. And when you make that pitch well, when you treat citizens like intelligent adults, 
uh, and not you know easy uh, you know people you can push around on emotions to our basis instincts. Citizens respond. I mean, I, I was trained as a teacher. I was a high school teacher for many years. And I'm a big fan of a study that was done at one point where two classes uh, that were you know, pretty much even in their distribution and their abilities were given to two different teachers. One teacher was told, you've got the brainiacs. Uh, these kids are going to end up at MIT. These are all the smartest kids in the, class, in the school. And the other ones, these are the slow kids. You have to be patient with them. Just you know, try and get them, get them through. The kids, of course, were exactly the same. But by the end of the first year, um, the smart kids were smarter and performing better on tests. And the kids who were supposedly slow were actually becoming slower. So people will rise to the level of your expectations. But in parenthesis, what a horribly immoral test. And, and uh, I, I know the rules are now that you can never do that again. Uh, but but the, uh, you, know, you can't do experiments like that. But, uh, but, but the lesson of trusting in citizens and trusting them to rise to the level that you engage with them is something that we really tried and succeeded at doing in our election campaign and Canada is not some magical place where everything works and everyone's nice to each other all the time although we we will stay sorry say sorry if you bump into us um, but but uh, uh, we need to understand that how we choose to lead and how we choose our leaders should be drawing on the best within us as opposed to protecting us from the worst among us. And I think that approach is what we need more. Uh, question from over here. You, in the uh, black and white. Yep. Hang on, you Who's got a mic coming right there. Hi, my name is Prentice Darden. I'm a landscape architect and I work in sustainability and urban design with respect to water. So with respect to climate change, energy gets a lot of focus for reducing emissions. And I'm wondering what's the leading thinking or is there anything you're particularly excited about in relation to water um, and sort of creating energy from wastewater in, in Canada? Um, first of all, we've, we've been investing significantly in, uh, in renewable energies and in research. One of the things we did just in our most recent budget was we put uh, $3 billion, which is uh, a significant amount of money for, for Canada, uh, into oh, it's a significant amount of money for everyone. Uh, but uh, uh, to compare Canada and the US, it's usually a, a tenfold. We have a tenth the population that you do, so it'd be like uh, investing $30, million, $30 billion into, uh, into pure and applied science, but mostly pure sciences in Canada. Uh, we've, we know that investing in science uh, and not saying, okay, this has to be science that's commercialable, uh, it's, it's just saying, no, 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 we're going to fund you mathematicians as well. Uh, we're going to fund those folks who, who are doing the, the pure discovery science uh, that will lead us to uh, the kinds of solutions we need uh, down the line. So. Uh, I, I don't take an overly heavy hand, and I don't think government should take an overly heavy hand in determining what scientists should be looking at and not looking at, but I can tell you there's a lot of people doing great work uh, on water, on energy, on renewables. <clears throat> it's a huge priority for, for us, for everyone. Canada is a country with big energy needs. We have really cold winters, uh, really hot summers. We have vast spaces between uh, our communities. <clears throat> and we're, we're energy intensive, so uh, getting those solutions is going to be really important. On water also, we've put <clears throat> oceans at the center of our leadership this year for the G7, and we're looking at a number of different things. We're looking at uh, things like sustainable fisheries, we're looking at uh, reducing the number of plastics, the amount of plastics that go into, uh, into our, our oceans, macro, micro, and nanoplastics. Uh, recognizing, of course, that uh, 10 rivers uh, in the world 
contribute 90% of all ocean plastics, and none of those rivers are in a G7 country, uh, but uh, we know that there is a need for real leadership on that. Uh, we also know that be doing a better job of collecting data uh, and doing science around our oceans and water to protect it uh, and sustain it, and uh, also uh, making sure we're building uh, weather resilient infrastructure, particularly in, uh, in, uh, in uh, small island states and developing states where uh, the impacts of more and more extreme weather events are having a huge uh, deleterious effect, not just on their livelihood, but on their capacity to contribute to the global economy. So uh, water, Canada is one of the places in the world with the uh, largest freshwater reserves of anywhere on the planet. Uh, we have done a terrible job of taking it for granted for far too long, and it's something we're being very, uh, very thoughtful and conscious about and uh, uh, investing in a lot of very, very smart people to, uh, to solve a lot of challenges. So thank you for your question. And we could just also note the role you play as an Arctic nation that is really a leader in Arctic policy, which also links back to water and energy. Very so I appreciate much. that work as well. Very much so. Yeah. Thank Take you. another question. We have time for uh, maybe two question. more. OK, up in the back. Yes, you, the super, <laughs> super fan. Thank you, know. Prime Minister Trudeau. Um, I'm currently a Saul Fellow uh, through the Ocheti Shagoi Fellowship with MIT. Yeah. Um, there are six of us fellows up here today um, from South Dakota. Uh, tribal reservations. And so my question is actually that of tribal community development. Hmm. Um, as a leader, how do you plan to look at sustainable community developments within the First Nations of Canada? And how do you do so in a way that incorporates the cultural values and beliefs of the First Nations people while also looking at capacity, capacity building to kind of push them forward into the future? Wow. Awesome. <laughs> <laughs> I never, let me just say, I never get this question in the United States, so I am so glad to be able to uh, talk about something uh, that is a huge passion for me. Um, it, you, Canada has a reputation as, you know, one of the global good guys. I mean, we're always out there, you know, telling people, you can do better, we can be nice to each other, we can solve this conflict, you should, you know, do this. and and you know. Because of that, we've been fairly complacent around some of our own challenges. But uh, in the last election, Canadians were very, very clear uh, during the campaign with me and with all parties that they needed uh, us to actually uh, make real steps towards reconciliation uh, with Indigenous peoples in our country. Uh, we have uh, systemically uh, and deliberately over the course of uh, generations and indeed centuries um, oppressed, marginalized, uh, ignored, uh, and you know, otherwise tried to assimilate uh, Indigenous peoples in our country. Uh, and it has been and continues to be a tremendous shame. There are people uh, living across Canada who don't have access to drinking water, who don't have uh, you know, basic educations. There's uh, you know, tuberculosis uh, epidemics going on in different parts of Canada in our native communities. Uh, and uh, it is time uh, we actually grounded a relationship built in respect and partnership. And recognition of fundamental rights that came with the original treaties, the spirit and intent of the original agreements when settlers came to this flourishing and occupied land and said, okay, you know, we're going to build our city in this corner of your land, but we will continue to support and work and partner and respect you as stewards of the land. And then, of course, as soon as the cities started to get built and resources started to be found, um, indigenous communities were more and more marginalized. Very similar story to what happened in, in, in the United States as well. Uh, we are now at a point where it is untenable from a moral but also from a practical uh, and an economic perspective. We cannot continue to be a successful country unless everyone has paths to success. And there's a lot of work to do uh, within our indigenous communities. One of the challenges we've taken on is uh, ending all boil water advisories uh, across Canada. I mean, Canada, as I said, country with the you know, most drinking water of uh, any country in the world, and we have 
are indigenous communities who can't drink the water uh, in their taps. So uh, we're concretely moving forward on those and other issues like the terrible violence against uh, indigenous women and girls that uh, not, uh, not just happens but then doesn't get noticed or followed up on by, uh, by, uh, by authorities. I recently saw a, an American movie, Wind River, that uh, uh, opened me up to the fact that you have a very similar challenge here in the United States than we have in Canada and we need to do a better job of that. But the big thing is, of course, creating opportunity, uh, building better schools, building uh, self-government and an ability to deliver one's own services and, and share traditional and indigenous knowledges in a way that uh, values and supports and, and cherishes the identity that has been Try, the identities that have been tried to be assimilated over so many, uh, so many years uh, by, um, by, uh, by settlers. So what we are embarking on now is a lot of capacity building because no matter how well-meaning the solution could come out of the federal government, oh, this is what you guys need, we're going to build you a new school here. The solutions, by definition, can't come from the federal government, need to come from the communities. But at the same time, for the, and there's obviously a, a wide range of challenges within those communities. Uh, there are some are doing great, some are a long way from doing great. If we show up and say, okay, what do you need? Some communities say, okay, uh, we have this plan for this youth center and this plan for the medical center. Great, let's work on it together. Others say, oh, we've never been asked what it is that we need. We don't even know how to begin to answer that question. So a lot of it is partnership, capacity building, working with them, empowering them uh, to uh, determine what their path is, looking at some, some of their neighbors and friends are doing. And it's a long path path towards true reconciliation, but quite frankly, it's something that is absolutely essential uh, to us as a country and, and to us as individuals to make sure that respect for uh, the, the, the people who've lived on this land for millennia and quite frankly figured out how to be long-term, uh, responsible, sustainable, open to diversity, I mean all those things that we're struggling with now, uh, many of them had solutions uh, millennia ago that uh, we tried to erase and now need to be valuing, drawing back and, and celebrating. So it's, it's a long path but it's one that uh, Canadians are very, very passionate about and I thank you very much, not just for your words, your activism, but also for giving me the opportunity to share a bit of our perspective. Uh, you in the red sweatshirt. And I think this is probably going to be the last question we have because uh, we're running out of time. Hi, thank you for being here. And uh, I'm a current graduate student in physics departments. And reflecting a theme that is discussed previously with other speakers, I was wondering whether you have a moment where you believe, you believe something is really true, but everyone around you thinks it is a totally bad idea. And you have a framework to deal with this kind of difficult situation. Thank you. <sighs> Um, oh, there's two different ways I want to go in this. So this is going to be the last question because I'm going to be ranting for a bit here now. Uh, Everyone just relax. There's two pieces of it. Uh, first of all, I really believe that in democracies, citizens have become very smart consumers of politics, and they know that politicians are you know, gonna you know, focus group the hell out of any given question and try and figure out what people wanna hear and then stand up and tell them what it is they want to hear. Uh, and that's sort of one of the things that has led to tremendous cynicism in politics. But I have always felt, and it's been sort of borne out, that uh, actually looking for those moments where the population firmly believes something, but you feel very strongly that they are wrong about that, and that you stand up and clearly say it in a, not a provocative way, but in a very comfortable, grounded way, um, is actually the kind of things that reassures 
voters and citizens in a democracy that you are willing to stand up for what you believe in and not just what's popular and you will do the right thing. And you know, one of the key examples was a, an issue uh, that came up in the last uh, election campaign uh, where the government of the day uh, that I ended up defeating um, had proposed, no, no, they, they had proposed uh, that we take away the citizenship of any uh, one in Canada who was uh, convicted of an act of war or of a terrorist act against Canada. Now that's the kind of thing that you'd say, well, duh. If you're going to commit an act of war or a terrorist attack against our country, you know, you just pretty much voided your Canadian citizenship, or you should have. The problem with that is that you, by definition, can't take the citizenship away from anyone who doesn't have any other citizenship. Someone who was born in Canada and who goes back 10 generations, no matter what you do, you can't take away their citizenship. So it would actually only apply to naturalized Canadians or Canadians whose parents were born elsewhere. So what it actually did was lead to uh, yeah, at this idea that there are two tiers of citizenship. That citizenship, even if you became a Canadian, it was always going to be conditional on good behavior. Now that is you know, very clear once you explain it that way. But standing on stage in a debate and having to say, no, I think you know, someone convicted of terrorism should be able to keep their Canadian citizenship is not really a popular argument to make, particularly in a time of, of fear and anxiety around terrorism, around, around uh, violence in the world. But being able to stand up for a fundamental conviction and saying, by the way, well, no, the place for a terrorist isn't on a plane back to Syria. A place for a terrorist is in jail for the rest of their life uh, is one of the counter arguments for it. But it became one of those things where, you know, you know that focus groups had said, you know, 80, 90 percent of Canadians said, yes, you should be able to take citizenship away from someone convicted of a terrorist offense. But actually being able to stand up and say, no, that's actually wrong and people are wrong when they think that that's the right solution, um, can be reassuring for citizens, even if they still disagree with me on that, that if I'm willing to stand up on such an unpopular issue that they disagree with, they'll know that on the things that we do agree with, I'm always also going to stand up as firmly and, and responsibly and logically for what I do believe in and what we do share. And that's really, really important. But the flip side of that, and sort of a different direction on that, is, and I talked about this a couple of days ago at, at, at the NYU commencement, it's easy to stand on your positions, your values, your point of view, and say, I'm right, and you're wrong, and I don't have to listen to you. I'm going to try and convince you that I'm right without being open to letting someone else convince you that you might be wrong. It's hard to be confident enough in yourself and your knowledge to be willing to be proven wrong and to have to change your thinking. I mean, if you are confident in your beliefs, you should be able to say, you know what? Challenge me on it and maybe you'll convince me that I'm wrong. But it'll only work if you're also open to being convinced that you're wrong and that I'm right. And then suddenly you have a conversation that's not about winning a debate or scoring points, but it's actually about learning from each other. And usually what ends up happening is you both end up in a place of greater understanding about the other's point of view and the other's perspective, you know, without necessarily moving too much in your own thinking. But there is an openness that then allows you to be more inclusive, more respectful, less polarized. So yes, it's important to be able to stand up for what you believe in and where you know, know deeply that you are right. But you cannot spend your time, therefore, you know, pushing back against everyone else and saying that they are wrong. That openness to being proven wrong is at the core of being, having integrity 
in your knowledge, in your science, in your research, and I know certainly uh, is something that as uh, responsible, brilliant thinkers here at MIT, you are all going to be challenged with repeatedly. And if you can think of bringing that through your life as well, uh, being able to be proven wrong without it crushing your soul and breaking who you are uh, is a gift of resilience on a personal and therefore global level uh, that we all need to challenge ourselves to do better. And that will help you solve. Thank you. <laughs>